Good afternoon. Well, I'm here today to tell a little bit about the Florida Virtual Story, but I want to get you kind of in a frame of reference. So I want to take you back on a trip down memory lane to 1996. How many of you remember where you were when the O.J. Simpson trial started? How about when Dolly the Sheep was cloned? And do you remember that in 1996, 16 megabytes of RAM was like a really big deal? It was also the year that the Nintendo 64 was released. Did anyone know which country? Japan. But you know what? I remember most, other than what I'm going to tell you about in 1996, was it was the year the Palm Pilot was launched. And I went and I got my Palm Pilot. And I brought it home and I had that box and I unpacked it and it was like that nice little shiny thing. And I took out the directions and I read the directions for two hours and then I put it right back in the box and I took it right back to the store and I said, this is way too hard. I like my Franklin planner. <laughs> but in 1996, that was actually the year that I had the privilege of beginning the greatest adventure of my career when I was appointed principal of what was then Orange County Web School not too far from here, which was soon to be one of the greatest innovations in education today. So who was I? Well, I started out as a traditional teacher. I was an elementary teacher. I was a middle school teacher. I worked my way up in what I called the specialist soup. And about the end of the 80s, I found myself in a job as a technology specialist in an elementary school in Fort Myers, Florida. We had been given a grant to develop a pilot technology school. It was my responsibility. We partnered with IBM, we had fabulous success, and we became one of IBM's global reference sites. So when my husband and I moved to Orlando in 1996, I had this very rich instructional technology resume, and those three little letters, IBM, 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 were all over my resume. So I found myself in a job not far from here, at Tildenville Elementary, and I was in my office one day and I received a phone call from downtown saying, could you please come and talk to us about a grant? And I thought, okay, I'm the new kid on the block. They probably just need a little advice, so I go downtown. And I meet with the deputy superintendent, Dr. Bob Williams at the time, and about 15 minutes into this conversation, I looked at him and I said, is this an interview? And he went, it is an interview. We're looking for an internet high school principal. I said, well, first of all, you do know from looking at my resume that the only thing that I know about high school is what I can remember from my own? <laughs> he said, well, that's exactly why we'd like to have you. We need someone who can design a school that's all about the kids in internet high school. So I said, well, okay. So he handed me a two-page concept paper and he said, how do you feel about taking a job that has no rules and no roadmap? And I said, well, as long as I know that you are supportive, the answer is yes. <laughs> so people ask me, how did you get this gig? How did you get this great job? And I say, think about it. It was 1996. It was grant funded for a year at $200,000. It was a job that didn't exist. And oh, by the way, every educator, for the most part, hoped it would fail. So no principal in their right mind would leave their day job. But for me, it was a promotion. So I remember driving home that day saying, I can't believe I just took a job that doesn't exist. <laughs> I thought, well, I'll just worry about that tomorrow. So I did. Have any of you have ever heard, the book, heard of the book Disrupting Class by Clayton Christensen, or if you have read it? If you haven't and you care about education, it's a great read. But Clayton Christensen's all about innovation. He's written several books about innovation. And as the title suggests, Disrupting Class is about disrupting innovation in education. And he actually uses Florida Virtual Schools as one of his examples in the book. So he describes an, a disruptive innovation as this thing that's like over here. It's this blip on the radar screen, completely out of the mainstream, completely away from the status quo making very little noise, but working away rapidly. And nobody's really paying any attention. And then one day, boom, it's there. And as I look back over 15 years, and some of you who probably know a little bit about Florida Virtual School, when you look at how it's developed, that's exactly how it seems. So Margaret Mead had a quote, 
and she said, never doubt that a small group of caring and committed, citi committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, that's the only thing that ever has. So our small group started with nine professionals housed at the Orange County School Board office in cubicles. And I remember the first day, remember I'm the elementary person, and I have eight new employees that are all high school people. And I didn't get to pick the first ones. So the first day, I walked in. It's our first staff meeting. I'm excited. And we can all fit around the conference table. And I take the word student. I write it on a piece of paper, and I put it in the center of the table. And I say, let's play a game. <laughs> OK, there's two rules to this game. First rule is you have to dream big. You have to think big. The second rule is you can't be a teacher in this game. You have to be a parent, a big brother or sister, an aunt or an uncle, a godmother, or a caring neighbor. And you have to have in your mind a child that you care a great deal about. All right, you ready? Let's play. The game is called What If. What if we were able to design a school that felt like an elementary school and was run like a private school? And what if this school didn't have to start at 7 a.m. when your brain and your body are not attached and end at 2.30 or 3 in the afternoon when it's time for football practice? And what if, when the end of the year came, if you had not mastered algebra, you didn't have to fail because you could just keep going? What if we could redesign this place called school so that time and place no longer held the student captive, and they were able to move at a pace that was different than their peers based on their own academic needs. What if we were able to design a school where the student was at the center of every decision that we made? What would that look like? So there was a lot of quiet, and then there was a lot of energy. And so what does Florida Virtual School look like? Florida Virtual School is open 365 days a year, and students can access their courses 24-7. Our teachers work year-round. They're available to students seven days a week from 8 in the morning until 8 p.m., and oftentimes beyond that time, they're available to their kids. Now, mind you, I said available. They are not tethered to their computer. It's kind of like your physician is available when you need them after hours. When a student enrolls, they enroll at a time that they need to enroll. So they can enroll any day of the year. So if I'm a teacher, my experience in this adventure is totally different than any experience I've ever had. Because now, I have kids that are in 150 different places in my class. So to get a picture of that, I always describe it. Have you ever been in a really phenomenal kindergarten class? You know, first day of school, there's nine, ten groups of kids, and the next week it changes, and the next week it changes, and the next week it changes, because the kids move and learn at different rates at different times. So what if we were able to design this new place called school? So from there, Florida Virtual School became a choice. It was not just a choice for kids, it was also a choice for teachers. No teacher would ever be involuntarily assigned to Florida Virtual School and the adventure would be unlike one they had ever had. So who are these kids? Because most of you probably think, unless you have a child, anybody have a child that goes to Florida Virtual School? Excellent. Awesome. High five. Yeah. Most people think this is for kids that they'll ask me, are these kids incarcerated? <laughs> Seriously. Or um, um, are these kids sick? Are these kids, they've, they've uh, been expelled. What's wrong with these kids? These kids are normal kids. These kids are your kids. These kids are kids who are um, public school students, private school students, and homeschool kids. And in Florida, it's free of charge public education to all students in the state. So imagine that. So to put a face on these kids, let me tell you a little bit about a few of them. First of all, I'm going to describe Katie. Katie is a child who is in a family of eight with six kids. No one in that family had graduated from high school, and Katie had decided she was going to be the first. But Katie had an interruption. 
She had a terminally ill disease. But she decided she was going to finish high school. Our teachers worked and worked with Katie, and Katie was on an extended pace. And oh, by the way, did I tell you that if kids need to take longer, they can, and if kids can move faster, they can. Katie finished her last course, and she looked at her mom, and she said, I'm done now. I can go. Katie passed away the next day. Or what about Colton? Colton spoke to 1,600 of our staff a month ago. And what Colton said to us is he said, Florida Virtual School gave me the greatest gift in the world. He said, my sister was a Marine, and she died in active duty. He said, when I went to spend time with my family, when I came back, I wasn't behind. I just picked right up where I left off. He said, I remember when I was in traditional school, I was ill for a week. And he said, it took me a month to catch up, and I almost failed the year. Or what about Eric? Eric was a little boy that was rather overweight. And Eric was taking our personal fitness course, PE online. Yes, get it through your head, PE online. <laughs> it's one of our very best courses. And most people don't really realize that 35% of the standards in PE are, are physical. They're exercise. And the rest are physiology, lifestyle, and learning about your body. So what we do in that class, which makes it really cool, is the kids get to choose their exercise regime. And what we know about that is that they'll keep doing it after they finish the class because it's their choice. So he and his mom had this gig they did every afternoon, a walking track that they took. And one day, his mom uh, started to have chest pains, and she collapsed. So Eric called the paramedics, and he began to take his mom's vital signs. And he was able to stay on the phone with the paramedics the entire time that they came to get to their mom, to his mom, and give them updates all along the way. Eric learned how to do that in his personal fitness class at Florida Virtual School. The paramedics told his mom, your son saved your life. His mom called us and said, Florida Virtual School saved my life. Or what about Lexi Thompson? Are any of you golfers? Lexi Thompson is the 16-year-old that just won the Navistar uh, LPGA tournament in Alabama a few weeks ago. Lexi's one of our students. She's been able to pursue her dream because she has the flexibility of Florida Virtual School. So when you think about does it work and who are these students, I think about Lexi and Eric and Katie and Colton. And I think about the gift that we have given them. And I think about how we teach children. So think about it. We put kids in a, in a classroom, and we give them all the same amount of time. We give them the same teacher. We give them the same book most times, and we expect them to learn in the same way. Imagine if, again, the end of the year came, and rather than having to fail, you've got to keep going. Well, that's what Florida Virtual School has been able to do, and our motto is any time, any place, any path, any pace. So keeping that in mind, back in 2000, this started to catch on. And there were other states that were interested in Florida Virtual School. And so they started to come to us and say, hey, we want one of these schools too, but we don't want to invent the classes. We don't want to do that. We want to borrow yours. I said, well, you can buy ours. <laughs> so at that point, legislation was being crafted for Florida Virtual School because we are a public school in the state of Florida Again, free to all students in the state of Florida. But we have this little piece of legislation that directs us to license and sell what we do out of state to bring dollars back into Florida Virtual School for research and development. So at that point, we became a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, spirit and we started to sell and license our courses and our services and our intellectual capital around the world. So today, we're actually in 49 states. We're in 59 countries around the world. We're there either as a tuition program or we're there offering our courses and teaching others how to do what we do. To give you a little flavor of the landscape in regards to virtual learning around the world, although we like to think that we were first, and some believe we were, the rest of the world is catching up. Mexico has had their content digitized for years, and they've just provided laptops for all their teachers. Singapore, every teacher in Singapore is trained to teach online. 
They have e-learning weeks where they actually practice for those tsunamis. And they have digitized all their content as well. Turkey and Canada both have online programs. They're digitizing their textbooks at the, as we speak. China, 1.3 billion people in China. They have 100 million students online. They're training all of their teachers as well. And they're moving all their content into digital content. And I just had the opportunity to visit Australia. Ooh, that's a long flight. And they are pioneers in the industry as well. When they started, they started for the kids in the outback. They now are providing virtual learning to all students. Four states in the United States now require that every student take an online course to graduate. Because guess what? They're going to have to take an online course when they get to college or when they go out to be trained for their job that they take after high school. It's the way of the world. So do I think that virtual learning is going to replace our traditional classrooms? Absolutely not. I think it's going to change them. I think it's going to change them dramatically. And I don't think that all of our kids are going to be in school buildings every day, all the time. At Florida Virtual School, we like to say that school should be a verb and not just a noun. And we feel like we've been privileged to be a pioneer in an industry where kids actually have an opportunity when they're with Florida Virtual School to have a front row seat all of the time with a personalized instructional model where they get to know that teacher one-on-one. -on -one. They can ask their questions in private. And what is the greatest joy is when you see a child who has struggled he has gotten behind in third grade and has never caught up and knows that he never will. All of a sudden, he has a private classroom with a personal teacher. And that personal teacher is taught to, number one, first, create trust. Number two, capture their intention. Number three, inspire them. Build a relationship with that student because you can't teach them until you do. And then that student, all of a sudden, learns that he isn't stupid. He's behind, and that gift of himself or herself starts to come through. And a student who hated math all of a sudden wants to be an engineer. Or a student who was desperately wanting to drop out of school because school was a bad place for them wants to be a teacher. That's the greatest joy. But you know what the greatest joy is? It's taking the time to put the student at the center of our decisions and creating a school that is all about those students rather than the adults' schedules. Thank you very much.